Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Hathaway. I'm the Executive Director of the Jesuit Forum, and I welcome you to this very special event. Uh, we're so happy to see so many people uh, here today. I see 243 participants. It keeps on going up by the minute. Uh, and a special thanks to Catherine Martin, who, uh, who performed that opening song for us. Uh, for now, as I say, I just want to welcome you in the name of the Jesuit Forum to this special celebration of the launch of Listening to Indigenous Voices. Um, and I, as I open today, I really just feel a lot of very deep gratitude for so many people who have made this possible. Uh, the artists, the, the, the writers, the advisory committee, there's people, we'll, we'll get into that later, but just to say that this resource is a huge collective uh, proof of generosity of many people. And of course, uh, I want to begin before I, I introduce our moderator, Harry LaFond with a land acknowledgement today. And uh, I invite you as I speak to acknowledge in the chat, uh, the territory where you live, peoples who have traditionally inhabited those lands and the treaties that you are a part of. For my part, I speak to you from Takaranto, a traditional meeting place on the northwest shore of Lake Ontario. I acknowledge these lands as a living community that sustains life. With all its plants, all the animals that walk, fly, swim, and crawl, the fungi and microorganisms that bind them together in community, as well as the gifts of water, air, and fertile soil. These lands have been the site of human inhabitation for tens or perhaps even hundreds of millennia, and are the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Petun First Nations, Onodawaga, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And this territory is subject to 
this incredible dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which was and is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the living land around the Great Lakes. And it's an image of one dish with one spoon. Uh, it's not a knife, it's not, it's, it's an image of sharing from the same dish and a commitment to take no more than what is needed, to share peaceably with those in need and to care for the land now and for future generations. Uh, it really is, and it really brings forward that treaties are not only between peoples, but also with other than human beings. It really is a commitment among all of us to live in community. And I acknowledge that Kakaronto continues to be the meeting place of indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island and even beyond. And on my part, I commit myself to honor and respect my obligations as a treaty person. So now I have the very great honor of uh, introducing and handing over uh, the moderation to, to, uh, to Harry LaFond, who's our moderator today. Uh, Harry is from Muskeg Lake First Nation in Saskatchewan, and he has served on the advisory group with the guide. Uh, he's the grandfather to 13 grandchildren. I think that's in itself a major, uh, uh, that, that's a big responsibility. That's, a, that's incredible. And he's also the former executive director of the Office of the Treaty Commissioner in Saskatchewan and has also served as a chief uh, in his community. Uh, <laughs> Harry has a master's in education and spends much of his time now relearning his traditional language, uh, listening to elders, and seeking Makotowin, building of relationships. So, Harry, Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to moderate today and welcome, and uh, I'll hand things over to you now. Thank you for, uh, for that introduction. Niganet quick nanas kum to know a note so tepe epe which is that way goma. Stay me as in a man I see him no copy. I want to welcome everybody that has taken the time this, this, this afternoon to participate uh, in this very important uh, uh, venture. My, um, my, I got the. My background is. Uh, comes from uh, central Saskatchewan. I am uh, a Cree person and uh, a Nehio. And I, I want to acknowledge that uh, I live in Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge that uh, Treaty 6 uh, incorporates all of the settlers and, uh, and the indigenous people of that territory. At this point, I would like to uh, uh, I would like to invite uh, Bob Phillips. Bob Phillips is uh, is a uh, is a Mi'kmaq, an urban Mi'kmaq, uh, uh, and uh, serves uh, serves uh, in in the university communities has a PhD uh, in, uh, from Trent, uh, has a fine, uh, master's in fine arts from, uh, from York University, and is uh, very active in, uh, in broadcasting. I would like to invite him to share with us a, an opening ceremony and invite you as participants to, uh, to participate in your own way uh, in bringing us into the right spirit for uh, for this special event, so Bob. Tansi, Bruju, 
من و میگویش که چی می که چی میگویش for inviting me here to uh, do the opening for this uh, marvelous marvelous event and especially an event that will be placing uh, uh, the kind of material that has been prepared uh, in our school system uh, to help uh, uh, young students understand better what uh, Native people are all about. And so chi 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 miigwech to everyone uh, who has invited me here for this. On the other hand, you know, shortly after I was uh, invited to uh, do the opening here, I began to sit around and think about when I went to school in the West End of Toronto, uh, both public school and high school. And uh, the, the more I, I began to reflect on that and remember about things, all of a sudden it dawned on me that back in those days, the 1950s and 60s, it would not have been possible for anyone to invite an Indian to come to a meeting like this one and do an opening. It simply would not have happened. And so I achieve a to everybody for inviting me here today because it indicates that there are changes beginning to occur. On the other hand, thinking about being a student back then, I also remembered the number of times that I was told I was stupid. I was told I was stupid so many times that I came to believe that I was stupid. And yet I have a PhD today. So clearly uh, I, I wasn't as stupid as they were telling me. But why would I have been treated uh, as if I was stupid? Well, back in those days, if you turn on the television, all you saw was cowboy and Indian movies and the Indians were primitive uh, savages. And uh, uh, native students were supposed to be at residential schools because they weren't uh, smart enough or developed enough to be in regular schools. So I can imagine teachers subconsciously looking at me and asking themselves, what is an Indian doing in my class? So the result is that I cannot uh, uh, condemn those, those teachers for the way they treated me. I don't believe they were bad people. I believe they were just doing what they thought society expected of them. So under those circumstances, I've come to see that these kind of changes, for example, my being here today is a marvelous uh, thing. But I especially here uh, uh, that in a, uh, an event that is set up by uh, 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 Jesuits. And then I began to say to myself, well, wait a minute, when I was a kid going to school, if you picked up a book that showed you what Jesuits were up to, they were always dressed fully in black and they were there uh, saying, blah, blah, blah. They, they were actually very difficult people. So what am I doing here today in an event that is set up by uh, uh, Jesuits? Well, as it happens, I spent a lot of time hanging around the Mary Ward Center and I met a lot of Jesuits. And to my absolute amazement, they are very sound individuals who dedicate their lives to helping other people and servicing other people. So in other words, the image that I grew up with of a Jesuit was a false image. And today we're, I'm beginning to see a more realistic image, which hopefully people are beginning to see a more realistic image of Native people. But then too, all of a sudden it dawned on me, you know, Jesuits are religious people. And when I stop and think of it, the religious organizations, the churches and things like that uh, are, are thought to have done a lot of damage to Native uh, culture and Native issues and Native rights and things like that. So why would I be sitting here uh, at, uh, 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 well, on the other hand, the uh, Mary Ward Center, which happens to be Catholic and therefore a religious organization, uh, you, has used me for several years as the elder for Kairos blanket exercises.
people's Kairos blanket exercises are being presented to help people see other people as being equal and, and that sort of thing to help help with that. And so here was the Mary Ward Center using the Kairos blanket exercises to teach Catholic students that what happened to Native people and that Native people are equal to everyone else. So in other words, after coming to realize that, I am very pleased to be sitting here, especially when I see what the uh, um, Jesuits and the other people involved with this did with this uh, beautiful, beautiful literature and artwork that will be placed uh, in schools to help uh, young people understand Native people and see Native people as being equal. Now that is marvelous because if you teach young people that other people are equal, then when they become adults, they will begin treating other people as equal. And if they become teachers, it won't be you're stupid. It will be, can I help you with that? So in other words, what is being done here today by the uh, Jesuits and the other people that are involved, uh, it, I think very, very highly of this, and I'm very pleased to be here. On the other hand, I have been asked to do an opening. Under ordinary circumstances, if I was at the Mary Ward for se uh, Center, for example, I would do a smudge in that. But uh, since we're online and we don't have a lot of time, I'll simply give a very fast prayer. Bonjour, Kichi Manitou, Kichi Makwa, and Dijin Kas, Nagigan, Dora, Migma, Anishnabi, and Dao, Wabanong, and Nonji. Migwich Kichi Manitou, Namino, Bamada, Ziwin. Minwa, Migwich Kichi Manitou for all of the wonderful gifts that we have been given. Migwich Kichi Manitou for the uh, artists and the authors who have helped create this beautiful, beautiful. Uh, uh, work that will be shared with the students. A and Chimugwich for the Native people who have helped and the non-Native people who have helped. Chichi Chimugwich for all of the uh, friends and allies that are gathered here today. So Chichi Chimugwich Nikanagana for all my relations. I think very highly of what is happening here. Chimugwich, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Harry. Uh, for the uh, rest of the meeting. Chimigwech, many thanks. Okay, Harry. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, <clears throat> very, uh, very pro yes, did a good job. Uh, th thank you very much for your uh, your thoughts, your sharing, and especially for the for the prayer that uh, that puts us into the into the uh, right spirit for uh, moving. In, into the introduction and launch of this very special piece of work that uh, uh, that's been uh, a challenge at, at times, but also very uh, very much a part of uh, of the lives of many people that contributed to, to its content and its development. At this point, we uh, I believe we we're going to listen to another song by Catherine, if I'm. Uh, actually, she's we're going to have to skip to that because of the uh, she hasn't come yet. So I think we'll just go right to you. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, the guide the guide has uh, has a, a fairly lengthy life uh, span, and um, and it comes at a, at a, a very critical time in in Canada where uh, conversation has shifted dramatically in terms of the relationship between Indigenous people, uh, the Canadian government and the Canadian uh, uh, settler population. It, it comes at a time when even the, the uh, settlement of Canada is changing its color tone, where we have far more uh, people moving into into Canada, settling and creating lives for themselves from other parts of the world besides uh, besides Europe. It comes at a time when uh, we are having conversations, uh, debating, and uh, trying to build a future on the basis of United Nations Declaration, 
uh, as a follow-up to the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission that came uh, as a as a, a, a wake-up call for all of us, for for all Canadians and all people that live on this land. This resource will help to unpack some of this, uh, some of this uh, environment that we live in. It gives an opportunity for, uh, for a culture of listening to begin to take shape rather than a culture of control and, uh, and the uh, oppressive type of, uh, of uh, environment that the indigenous people have experienced for the last uh, uh, four or 500 years. And we have some people to share with us their stories and their involvement in, in, this, uh, in this work. And I think we need to always focus on, on, on seeking what is good and what is hopeful in, in the materials that we, uh, uh, that we work with. Uh, many of the uh, uh, knowledge keepers and elders that, uh, that from my area that uh, speak about the future, uh, talk about the need to recognize that that every situation has two sides to it, the negative and, and the positive. And in, in this particular resource, it, it's really struck me uh, in reading uh, the uh, uh, Nikki Sanchez uh, article, the, the importance of looking towards a future uh, that uh, really emphasizes that this is this is a Canadian issue. This is not a. This is not an Indian problem. Um, this is a Canadian issue, and it involves all Canadians. And that uh, a change of culture and change of, uh, of, of relationship building uh, processes will help all of us to to see uh, a much more uh, healthy way of living together on this on this uh, land that's been gifted to us by uh, Mamuyo Tawimau. One of the uh, one of the contributors and authors uh, that uh, that made a, a significant uh, contribution to this uh, document uh, it comes from uh, Stolo territory. She's a Stolo woman. Uh, she was born in uh, North Vancouver. She has a family of uh, four children and four grandchildren, and she spends her time um, bringing her giftedness with words and with stories uh, to us as Canadians. And, and she is now involved with the University of, uh, of Toronto. It seems like many universities are seeking for uh, for input from Indigenous uh, knowledge keepers. And I'd like to introduce Lee Miracle who, has, uh, who provides that for the University of Toronto. So Lee. Hi, how are you doing? Good. I'm, I'm, I'm given to understand this is about justice and, and I think we should think about that a little bit because I think what, you look, what it looks like is that we've accepted that this is Canada and that we're colonized and everything's okay, uh, but we should, we should be uh, colonized in a gentler way. I'm, I'm a Stalo, and my territory go, starts in Tilwek and uh, goes to Tsleil-Waututh uh, uh, and then over to Musqueam and then down into Skagit River and across over to Montana. It's a big territory. And most of it is in the um, other country that was also colonized. And so I have a, I have a different view of uh, what justice looks like for us. I think that we're, we've accepted that the European occupation is just, as long as uh, we get a bigger share of whatever this is. I'm not sure what this Canada is, 
But it started off with uh, Canada, Canada meaning village. And we don't have a village here. We have a whole big country. It's largely occupied by other people. The people who once occupied this land are mostly dead. In my territory, uh, just in the Vancouver area alone, there is a million people that died. We now have 27,000. So you can see the level of death of indigenous people. There can be no justice in that for us. That's massive. It's like asking the Jewish people to accept the Holocaust and just move along. And I don't think they have. I think they keep saying never again. So I'm not accepting that that's a good foundation for justice. So what is a good foundation for justice? Well, first of all, you live in someone else's territory if you're not indigenous. I'm living in someone else's territory right now. This is the treaty of the dish with one spoon. It's a treaty between Anishinaabes and their allies and Haudenosaunee and their allies, none of whom are me. Even though I have Miracle as the last name, I was married to someone that was Haudenosaunee, not, I don't come by that name legitimately. I'm a Stalo. So then I have to behave as a guest in accordance with Stalo law. And I have to pay attention to the law that exists here. In the Treaty of the Dish with One Spoon, the general agreement was a sharing arrangement, not a sharing arrangement just between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe, but whoever moved into the territory. So then I give over my gifts through the University of, of Toronto and through my writing and through my talks like this. I give over my knowledge as part of the sharing arrangement that I come to understand is also my responsibility. If I'm to be here in the treaty of the dish with one spoon, that I must conduct myself in accordance with the laws that are here. And those laws to me are not just, you know, Canada and its constitution and whatever arrangements it makes, but the fundamental laws that exist between Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee people. That's who I am. That's who I am, and that's what I think justice is. And we're not often asked, okay, so what is uh, your perception of this territory of yours? Well, there's 27,000 people that no longer have access to any of the territory that they once had dominion over completely. And since that time, since they haven't had dominion over it, that is, they can't control what happens to it, the fish have been depleted. The ocean has been uh, damaged. The, the uh, mountains are clear cut. There's no mink left in our territory. There's no wolf, there's no cougar, there's no uh, uh, wolverines, there's no grizzlies. All of these animals are gone because of what's happened as a result of invasion. So justice for me is bigger than what we're considering. What's the justice for the animal life, the plant life, the tree life, the water life, the fish life, all of these lives that we once took care of? We are stewards of those lives. And I'll tell you that in our stories, it doesn't say little brown people are responsible for everything it says people are. So the people that live there, those that uh, have occupied our territory are also responsible. And when they pass on to the next world, they're going to be asked, what did you do for the land? And if they say nothing, they're going to have to return here and get it right. Because that's what our, our way tells us, that if you don't get it right on the first pass, you have to come back and, and try and get it right. Try and make it right between yourself and creation. Yourself and creation. We aren't just tied to one another and trying to share equitably with one another, which, which is what I hear being said, that justice is between people. No, justice is between ourselves and the earth and all life on it. So that's the second uh, point that I want to make to people. Not that anyone has to listen to me because, you know, we don't have any command over our territory anymore. So nobody has to listen. 
But one of these days you will face the creators of, uh, uh, of the goodness that this land had to offer. And they will be talking to you about what your conduct was like on the, in this territory. Our conduct here was determined thousands of years ago. It's contained in the stories, it's contained in our laws, and we are directed to take care of the earth, the land, the waters, the trees, the skies, the skies especially, which right now are very, very damaged with you know, pollution in the air and so on and so forth. So we have to come together, not to just say what's fair between us, but what's justice for everything, justice for all, justice for the land, justice for the waters, justice for the skies. And what are we going to do together to restore the beauty, the wealth, and the livingness of this earth before anyone came and invaded it? So that's, that's the third point I want to make. And the last one is that Takaranto is uh, where we are, and I'm glad people are saying that um, because I was uh, I was looking up the meaning of Toronto, and there's all kinds of arguments about what Toronto means. But actually, there's no no word Toronto in anybody's language. It's Takaranto. Takaranto has a very definite meaning to very many peoples that are here, and it is a gathering place. It is not a gathering place. Uh, for fun and frolic, but it's where people came to fish, people came to process food, and they came for also social reasons. So it's a long standing relationship that all of the people in this territory have with each other around this place called the Toronto. And so I came here many, many, many years ago. Oh my gosh, over. Uh, over 40 years ago, anyway, <laughs> 44 years ago, I came here. I haven't stayed here the whole time, but I do recall there weren't that many people here when I first came. Uh, Montreal was bigger, Vancouver was bigger, Winnipeg was about the same size. So there's many, many more millions of people since then, since I first came here as a 16 year old. And I'm not surprised that it's where we gather here. But how did we come to know that? How did we come to sense that? How do we come to understand that? I'm not sure, but I do know that when I find out what this place has meant to people before, then I understand why I'm here, why I came here, why I want to see a Canada arise out of this place. I think that's a possibility. There's 168 nations living in this small place from all over the world. And I'm not surprised that that happened, that this is the city that has pulled all those nations together. I'm not surprised about that at all, given the history of this place. The oldest road, they say, in the world exists in this city. It's called Davenport now but it's thousands and thousands and thousands of years old and people came back and forth to gather here. So it's one of the things I pay attention to when I'm thinking about what's my responsibility here. I cannot welcome strangers to this territory, but I can be a good guest. And so I think that people who come here should think about that. How do I be a good bit guest in Takaranto, what's expected of me? And so then I look at the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee and the Treaty of the Dish with One Spoon. One spoon. And the second thing I take, pay attention to is taking only what you need. Now, some people say, oh, I need a new car. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> You're quite capable of walking. <laughs> but we have to be careful that our needs are in relation to what the earth can provide. And that's what we're not paying enough attention to. So I 
am a person that pays attention to that. I haven't had a car since I came out here because out here you don't need a car. You have a wonderful transit system that goes all the way throughout the Golden Horseshoe. And uh, people complain about it, but it is wonderful to have a way of getting around that we have in common. So I'm paying attention to that. And I'm paying attention to making sure that I don't deplete the earth with my presence here. I think that's what taking what you need means. So that's my uh, little bit of contribution to the word justice. Justice for the land, justice for the sky, justice for the animal world, the plant world, and justice for one another. Kajka, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> appreciate uh, your thoughts and your your perspective. It's certainly uh, a challenging perspective for many of our communities to uh, to move in that direction. The colonization has been fairly fairly thorough in uh, dis in dissembling our, our societies, and so uh, people have to be brave and have to take risks to uh, to go and look at where they came from and the families that, uh, that, that got them here. Uh, welcome to uh, Catherine Martin. Uh, I, we appreciated the opening song that, um, that, that uh, you provided. And uh, I think uh, I'll take uh, liberty here as, uh, as the moderator and say that after the next speaker, if you're if you're willing, we could listen to uh, to more of your music. So I'll need to. Uh, you'll need to let me know about that. We talk about justice, and uh, our next speaker definitely uh, lives in a world of justice, uh, many different uh, perspectives. Uh, Sylvia McAdam Sasewaham is, uh, is uh, lives or comes from uh, my territory, uh, just a, an hour's drive from where I live right now, and uh, she has spent a good part of her adult life learning about justice from uh, from the Nahio perspective, and and, uh, and making it. Uh, a topic uh, that uh, that touches all our lives today and, and challenges uh, status quo thinking about uh, about the laws that uh, that exist both in the Nehio world and in the uh, in the Canadian uh, in the Canadian uh, uh, environment. Uh, Sylvia did her uh, university wor uh, uh, work at uh, University of Saskatchewan, uh, acquired her, uh, her uh, Juris Doctorate uh, from there, and also did a, a bachelor's degree in human justice from uh, University of Regina. Uh, she's also probably better known for her work with uh, uh, with the uh, 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 Idle No More movement, uh, certainly touched all of Canada and a good many parts of the Indigenous world uh, with that movement to to uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, that protesting can be uh helpful and uh, awakening for for people uh, and and to be able to do it in a good uh in a good way as would be expected by our Cree elders so welcome sylvia and uh share with us your your uh your thoughts and your work with uh, with this project Thank you for the your your kind words. Can I ask you to 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 
I am a direct descendant of treaty peoples and I carry the words of um, generations of warriors, women, um, the many voices that flow through my bloodline, the blood memory of, of my people. So in saying that, I, I'm going to speak boldly and very fiercely from those places of my blood memory. And I, I want all of you, I wanna draw attention to the attendees that I, I'm an educator and I, I don't leave that very far behind because on the chat there, I did put materials for everyone to read. And I want to bring particular attention to the work, a documentary by uh, Stephen Newcomb called The Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code. You can go and rent the documentary for, I think it's like $6 for 24 hours, something like that. I, I posted the website there. I think it's really important for all of you to make it a priority to watch it. It's going to hit you in the guts. <laughs> your stomach will, will be affected, your, your spirit. But it's, it's an important documentary and every one of us need, need to, to watch it. I, I am a pro assistant professor at the University of Windsor Faculty of Law, and this is a documentary that is a required uh, viewing for first year law students. It's mandatory. Now, this documentary um, speaks about the details of what the doctrine of discovery, also referred to as the doctrine of Christian discovery has done all across the lands. And I know that the, it's, it focuses primarily on the United States, but it also affects Canada. I say this because in the United States, they had Christopher Columbus. Here in Canada, we had John Cabot or John Cabot, depending on who you talk to. John Cabot came here. No one was really sure where he first stepped foot. But when he stepped foot on the soils of indigenous people, the lands, he brought with him a sword. And that sword is shaped that of a cross. And when he, he came onto the soil, he did similarly what uh, Christopher Columbus did. He took that sword and put it deep into the soil and he did a Christian chant, a Christian liturgy. And when he did that Christian chant, he baptized the lands. And in that moment and in law, in the common law, it is referred to as that moment, the assumed or presumed sovereignty of the crown crystallized. It crystallized. And so when he did that, there's something that is not spoken about too often. He also took possession of the people in name of their sovereign. You see, they took possession of indigenous peoples. Okay, fast forward to today. A year and a half ago, I got elected into the Indian Act Chief and Council System, the Indian Act. And I argue that it, Canada is still an apartheid state. And I argue that because of the dehumanization and domination language adopted from the court cases, um, and from the doctrine of discovery, you see. Now, the court cases that are referred to in the documentary are used in Canada. They are used every time Indigenous peoples go to court. Now, the courts are not going to say it's the doctrine of discovery. No, no, because the United Nations has condemned colonization and all of its manifestations. However, every court case, you will see the language called underlying title of the crown. 
that's the doctrine of discovery, underlying title of the crown. So today you hear the legal language thrown around, spoken about as if it's nothing, but really you need to analyze the English language. So I learned your language. I learned the European language. I also know my language. So if I have the ability to learn your language, I invite every one of the attendees and all the people listening to this, this uh, conversation, learn the language of domination and dehumanization. Now, when you look at the media and the language used even in media, you'll see that the media calls indigenous people protesters. If someone broke into your home, no one in their right mind would call you a protester. No, you see, the language is so insidious. When you call indigenous people protesters, you position them as if they're oppositional. You position them and remove them away from their land. You see, that's, that's an example of the dehumanization and domination language. Now, in the legal language, and law has a very specific language, it's called legalese. And of course, you have to be trained to recognize the language of law. But I'll give you an example. In all of the court cases that have to deal with Indigenous people, there are words that are used and people are most familiar with usufructory, fiduciary. Okay, let's examine those languages. Usufructory means that, okay, so right now I'm in um, a hotel uh, meeting room the chief and council of the reserve that I'm registered in as an Indian rented this room. So we become usufructory occupants of this room. We rented it for a specific time. We come in, we can move the chairs around, maybe we can move the tables, but we can never ever change the core of the room. Can't tear this room down, can't take that door down. That's how these, these cases identify indigenous peoples. We are merely occupants. We can't ever go take down the trees. We can't tear up the soil. You see, that's, that's the language of domination and dehumanization. And now let's take a look at uh, fiduciary. When you, examine, when you examine the word fiduciary, um, the courts have described it as the crown has a trust-like relationship with indigenous peoples. The only time a trust relationship is put in place is when um, the executor of an estate has to deal with or uh, control, uh, work with someone um, connected to that estate that's incapacitated, like a child, a mentally challenged person, person with dementia. See, that's fiduciary. And the courts have described fiduciaries as, as like a similar as a trust-like relationship. See, again, it's that dehumanization and domination language that never always renders indigenous people as incapable and as wards of the state. And you see that in everything, we're saturated in it. We have to report the monies the government gives each band 10 times more. And yet the Department of Indian Affairs is not required to make any concrete reporting. So the biggest thing that I want all of you to understand is that, sorry, I'm on.
camera. <laughs> I got sorry. I, there's kind of a few activities going on. So I suggest to everyone that's listening in. The biggest thing that I I impart to my students is that learn to identify the dehumanization and domination language of the colonizers were saturated in it, including the churches. The churches are the biggest, um, let's see, how should I put it? The church and state have enforced brutal, savage systems of misogyny and patriarchy that have uh, generational repercussions. I say this because of the patri 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 patriarchy that Indigenous people learned from the church that has not existed at the time of European contact. I'm currently doing research on, on um, the clothing of Indigenous women and I'm just shocked at where that has gone. Did you know at the time when Europeans first came here and we, they came with the Jesuits and the Jesuits are, are gifted people. I, I, can, um, I see that in my research. They were specifically, specifically picked for their, their, their skills. Now, there were no pictures, of course. They, they did uh, drawings and artwork when they first came um, across Indigenous women. The Indigenous women here were bare-breasted. They were bare-breasted. And then when the church got a hold and became entrenched on the lands, you can see women covering up more and more and more. And the brutal and ugly language that was used to describe Indigenous women because they were bare-breasted by the so-called discoverers and explorers and, and the Jesuits was just, it's just horrific. It's just horrific and learning learning shame about the body and and the mutilation of women's bodies i i can't even begin to tell you like the cutting off noses i i found out that the saint saint james bible had a canon law that directed um the church to mutilate women as a form of discipline and that came from Europe. I was wondering why I was coming across images of, of indigenous women with their, their no noses cut off. And I found out that came from the church. So it's things like that. Um, I invite the church to question, evaluate what, what you are teaching. I do not support um, the hatred of women, the mis misogynistic um, ideologies that have been adopted. And I see it, I, I see it all over indigenous communities. Like for instance, again, I'm gonna come back to the Indian Act system. This is the first time that two women in, from my reserve have been elected into the Indian Act system. For the longest time, my reserve believed that women women should not be in leadership. I don't even want to call the Indian Act system leadership, but it is what it is right now. There's so much to be said, and I want to invite every one of you to evaluate what the church's role is in, in um, the patriarchy and the misogyny and what, and what the state continues to, to um, enforce in terms of the Indian Act, and I believe that's an apartheid system, and I'll be, I'll be um, doing research on that. And I also um, wanted to, to tell, to also say to you all that right now, the University of Sudbury, a Jesuit-controlled institution situated upon Anishinaabe 
um, territories is experiencing unprecedented, unprecedented difficulties with the news of the dissolution, dissolution of the Federation by Laurentian. It also houses the second oldest um, Indigenous Studies program in, department in North America, North America, always billing itself as holding a tricultural mandate. It was recently announced there were going to be a 100% Francophone institution dissolving the Department of Indi Indigenous Studies and effectively dissolving their commitment to Indigenous education, truth, and reconciliation. What role do the Jesuits have in this decision? decision? Is there any way for them to advocate for the continuation of their commitment to Indigenous education? You see, and that came from a good friend of mine who was let go from teaching Indigenous studies and she's an Indigenous woman. Now these programs are going to be taught by French speaking non-Indigenous people. So, you take one step forward and it seems like there's two step back, two steps back, and you take a look at UNDRIP that's going through their parliament. I'm I'm at first I supported it, and then when I went in to evaluate it, oh it's, it's really problematic. And I started to think, why are we supporting? Why is there UNDRIP going through um, the colonial parliament when they can even uphold the treaty terms and promise um, found under Treaty 6. You know, in Treaty 6, it says one square mile per family of five. I'm still waiting for my one square mile. And that's a treaty term and promise. And I keep talking about that. I keep, I want, I want my land. I want my land, not the Indian Act pieces of land that we're imprisoned in no no and also the land claims process that is so problematic when you go in to review it you'll see that it's the indigenous people that have to go and prove that this is this is their land they have to go and follow that process and they have to prove hey this is and how how is how does that make sense that doesn't make any sense it should be the other way around. The government needs to prove where they get their title. Where do they get their title? You look at the Torrent system of um, getting title in, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and that's what they require. They ask, is that good title? Is that land good title? That's just basic common law question. Now we need to ask Canada, do you have good title? Does Canada have good title? No, they don't. That question was posed to them in February 2013 at the United Nations by CERG, the Committee on the Elimination of Race and Discrimination. They asked Canada, show us your title. Where, where's your title to Canada? Do you think Canada is able to produce it today to date they have not answered that question. They haven't. Instead, they came back here going through contortions, trying to find ways to extinguish Indigenous title holders like myself. I am the Indigenous title holder. I am the direct descendant of treaty peoples. Canada, Canada needs to come to me, not to AFN, not to FSIN, no. This is sloppy manufactured consent the easy way around to extinguish Indigenous peoples and their title to the land. That's what this is. And I'm getting a, um, older, so my filter is diminishing because I am not the type of person that romanticizes. I've grown past that. I used to say, oh, you know, my, if my grandchildren would take up this fight, no. <laughs> I, I'm at, I, I realized I don't want my grandchildren to take up this fight. I don't want them to do that. It ends here. I want it to end with me. I want the land back. And for people who 
who want to support indigenous people call on the government to rescind and abolish the doctrine of discovery that they use every time we go to court and it's called the underlying title of the crown if i went to you if I, all of you here if i went to you and i said i have fairy dust here i have fairy dust in my hands would you believe me would you believe me hopefully not because that's what the doctrine of discovery is it's fairy dust it came from the imaginations of white men and that's what that's what we need to talk about. That's what needs to be said. And to my last breath, I want the land back. I want the land back. And there's a group of people here in Saskatchewan that started what is called the Treaty, Treaty Land Network, white people. And we work with them. And they want to see, they want to find a way to give the land back to Indigenous peoples. And that's beautiful. And that's a, a beautiful starting point. But I would rather see the treaties upheld and honored. One square mile per, do you know what I could do with one square mile? Do you know the economy that has been withheld from Indigenous peoples? All of us, every one of us need to know those treaties. I know them. I, I could quote Treaty 6 almost verbatim. It's seared into this heart. And that's the way it should be. I went to court. I was charged for being on my people's land. My brother and I, we went to court. We were at risk of being jailed and fined. And the judge asked a very important question there. He said, what jurisdiction does the province have? And now, now, quickly I'll wrap up. Here in Saskatchewan, in 2017, the province armed the conserva conservation officers with AR-15s, military style weaponry. You know, you need to, and we say this um, amongst ourselves, but all of you that are non-Indigenous, you need to call out your cousins. You need to call out your relatives that are putting these problematic um, laws in place. And then in 2019, after the Colton Bushi and that Gerald Stanley decision, <laughs> another law was passed, which diminishes the liability of private property holders on stolen indigenous lands. You know, my son, my son who almost died a year ago was approached by, he, he was on a public road on a broken down truck and a farmer was circling him with a gun and a dog. Those are you guys' relatives. You need, to, you need to talk to the people that are living in these urban centers, in these rural centers, the farmers. <sighs> you know, if you're feeling anything from my presentation, feel it, feel it, but don't stay there. If you feel guilt, then feel it, but don't stay there. If you feel sad, feel it, but don't stay there. I want you to care about my people and to see them as human. Because right now the state doesn't, and I, I, I say the church doesn't either. If you continue to support the doctrine of discovery and all of its manifestations, then you do not see me as human. I need you to care about my people and even better to care about the land and the water because 
we we can't do this alone. We're headed to a, a crisis that's uh, that's go not going to spare anyone right now. It's such a privilege to talk about this stuff. It is. It's a privilege. In other parts of the world, people are dying without water, scorching lands. We're headed there. Look, look. In in a, in the northern lands there, where I'm from where there's beautiful waters and trees. Well, not trees anymore because the deforestation it, it has taken all the trees. And, you know, never in the memory of my people have we ever had wood ticks. You know, now we have wood ticks. We don't know how to live with them. We'll learn, but never in our collective memory have we ever had those things. And, and that's from climate change and the climate crisis that all of us are facing. The biggest problem is the complacency, getting ordinary Joe to get off his chair in front of the TV. So thank you always thank you and for the ones that have been doing this work and standing in solidarity with my people i see you i see you and i just thank you so much i do thank you i can ask no thank you and may may the creator bless all of you Thank you so much for listening to me. No, Pnana Skumton Sylvia, the Stahimton Kimina and Kumam Tonetta Mahoma. We thank Sylvia for her thoughts, for her challenges, for, uh, for her honesty and passion for the, uh, for the uh, betterment of our relationship uh, with the uh, between the settler community and the indigenous community. Now, I am wondering, is Catherine ready to provide us with a song at this point? Hi, I'm here. <laughs> okay, can I invite you to... Uh, to yes. To provide us with a song. Catherine I'm is just a trying to get, oh, there's my video. Okay. Uh, I just, there. Okay. I can't start. Oh, there, you let me in. All right. Hello, everybody. Hi. And thank you for letting me send my song in at the beginning because it's my mom's 87th birthday and uh, the family, you know, did one of these Zoom things. So I, I, I had to I had to be there to open. So I'm gonna open this or sing the second song and it's about basket makers. My sister wrote the words, her name is Mary Louise Martin and I put the music to it. And uh, I just finished a film called The Basket Maker about Mi'kmaq women basket makers and their contribution to the economy and to our survival. <clears throat> Some of you would relate to the basket maker, I suspect. Whisco, 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 whisco. Basket maker, basket maker. Old woman with the laughing brown in your eyes. Sinewy, leathery hands, so strongly defined. The basket maker, basket maker, basket maker, own keeper of time. Whisco, whisco, whisco. Basket maker, basket maker, old woman with the laughing brown in your eyes, 
sinewy, leathery hands, so strongly defined. The basket maker, basket maker, basket maker, own keeper of time. Whisk, 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 whisk. Basket maker, basket maker, you have the heart of a fawn. And any child would see you are the mystery of dawn. What thoughts have you as you sit so silently? Making works of wooden lines, weaving my basket up and down, in and out, all around my basket so fine. Whisk, whisk, whisk. Basket maker, basket maker. Old woman with the laughing brown in your eyes. Sinewy, leathery hands, so strongly defined. The basket maker, basket maker, basket maker, own keeper of time, own keeper of time. Whisk, 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 whisk. Daho, walalio. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, the, for uh, Catherine. Uh, Catherine's community is Millbrook First Nation in Nova Scotia, and now uh, Catherine's working with Dalhousie University, I believe, uh, yep. helping them to uh, to understand their indigenous uh, uh, background, I guess, and history. So, thank you once again, uh, Catherine. In relationship. And uh, and I'm proud to say that we speak because of our ancestors and our peace and friendship treaty. So, Balaliok, and I'm enjoying hearing everybody. Maybe I'll see you at the end if you have time. Oh, for sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Balaliok. So, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> this type of a project requires a. Uh, uh, a great amount of organization is a very complex process and it involves a, a whole pile of people. Uh, and uh, so we're going to give a, an opportunity for uh, some of the players to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, their involvement, their contribution to, uh, to this very fine resource that uh, we're launching today. And I would uh, like to begin by uh, uh, the... Uh, origins of, uh, of the guide, uh, of the guide project. And I'd like to invite uh, uh, Peter Besson to, uh, to speak to that. Uh, I think Peter is uh, a Jesuit and he is the Canadian Jesuit, uh, from the Canadian Jesuit province and he's based out of Ottawa. And uh, he told us that he was the one that uh, really pushed to have but uh, the Jesuits uh, go forward with this project to give some life to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the 94, uh, 94 uh, items that, uh, that challenge us to change the, the nature of uh, Canadian, Canadian life. So I'd like to invite uh, uh, Peter to uh, share with us uh, the origins of, of this project. Thank you, Harry. I'm honored to be a part of this group and to he receive the words of wisdom and shared experience that we've heard so far. And uh, I'm, I'm honored and pleased also to see this 
fantastic project come to realization. As Harry said, I address you as a guest from uh, uh, unceded Anishinaabe Algonquin Territory, Ottawa, and I'm originally from the territory of the Madawaska Maliseet First Nation, the Stuckyuk First Nation in uh, New Brunswick. Uh, so I'm very grateful for the backgrounds that have helped me to come to where I am today. So in uh, somewhere in the turn between 2017 and 2018, the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice decided that it would produce this guide that now is called Listening to Indigenous Voices. I had asked them to do that. So I'd like to share with you some of the, the main reasons why I asked them to do this. It, this was a little bit out of their experience. They had focused more on ecology um, and uh, the social ideas of the social justice ideas of the Catholic Church. So this was a bit out of their experience, but I really encourage them to take this risk. Well, there are basically three reasons why I asked them to do this. One was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Another was a, a communal decision that the Jesuits and our partners had made in 2015 to privilege Indigenous relations. And thirdly, was also the, 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 the hesitations of Catholic leadership in Canada about reconciliation. Um, so I'd like to say a little bit more about each of those points. I was often at the table with the uh, TRC commissioners and their meetings with the representatives of the parties to the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. This was a process of many years. I learned so, so much from that table, uh, especially from the commissioners and from their work. And I acknowledge Marie Wilson, who is here with us today. I often felt challenged by what they had to say, but I felt challenged also by their attitude towards the uh, settler representatives at the table, of which I was one. They challenged us without fear, but they also treated us with respect and reverence. And they never treated us as defendants, even though they had every right to, I thought, to treat us as defendants. So by their words, but also by their attitudes, I learned a lot about what right relations could mean, right relations uh, and a shared future and a shared love of the land, what that could mean. And I felt that uh, that kind of message we needed to take, our, take to heart, uh, to work on our own decolonization, but also to help others on a similar journey. The same year that the TRC finished its work, the Jesuits and partners in Canada, we had a large meeting over many days about what our priorities or our attitudes should be going into the future. The first one was spirituality, not a surprise to anybody. The second one though, was to focus on indigenous relations uh, and that that should be part of how we did things in Canada. Now, this did not mean working in indigenous parishes. This meant a relationship of partnership and uh, equality and not helping indigenous people uh, but asking for the help of Indigenous people in our own decolonization and working as partners in things that Indigenous people might want our help on. This was a big change in our attitude and approach and at the, uh, it caused some controversy among us, but it has since settled and we're slowly over time working out what this might mean and working it out in partnership with Indigenous organizations and friends. So just to give you an example of the significance of this decision for us, at the end of this meeting, it lasted about a week, uh, an Indigenous elder uh, said, at last, I feel like a friend. At last, I feel recognized. And we'd been partners for 40 years. 
So for 40 years, she felt that we had been, while we were friends, patronizing. She would never say that. But why else would she say, finally, I feel recognized. That was a big learning experience for me and for us. She said it with great gentleness and respect between friends. And finally, the third reason, I, could, I, I was a leader in the Catholic Church uh, and I, of course, had contact with other leaders in the Catholic Church. And around the TRC table too, I saw um, other religious leaders at work. And I could see while the Catholic institutional leaders in the Catholic Church were not against reconciliation, there was a lot of hesitation about what reconciliation could mean, a lot of fear, for example, about being sued. Um, but especially as we experienced ourselves, the Jesuits, fear about what re-looking at our identity and our story and learning how Indigenous peoples saw us and working with us. So that change of identity, I think, was more terrifying, has been more terrifying than um, potential lawsuits were and might be. So I really felt that uh, people who experienced such hesitations, and we did ourselves too in a major way, needed help needed help from Indigenous people and needed help in education and needed help in um, working on our own decolonization. And so that these three reasons, the TRC, the uh, collective decision that Jesuits and partners made about privileging Indigenous relations and acknowledging the hesitations uh, around reconciliation, these were all some of the big reasons why I asked the Jesuit Forum to take their skills in preparing educational and empowering guides and apply those skills to uh, the gift that the TRC had given us in Canada. So I thank the Jesuit Forum for taking this risk. And I thank all of everyone in this gathering uh, who have helped the Jesuit Forum uh, produce this guide. Uh, and I have great hopes that it will be uh, among many instruments that will help us build a better shared future together and a better shared future on the land together that we have been gifted responsibility for. Miigwech, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, you talk about the uh, TRC and I think uh, the best person we should hear from in regards to TRC and the relationship of, uh, of this resource with uh, with the work that uh, she did with uh, Justice Sinclair and uh, Chief Willie Littlechild. Marie Wilson comes to us um, to, uh, to share uh, her thoughts on and her involvement uh, with this project from, from that perspective. So welcome uh, Marie and you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Alder Lafon. I'm um... I'm speaking uh, from Yellowknife, which is where I live with my family. Um, and we would say here, to give thanks for the gift of life and the gift of this day and the grace that has brought us all safely to it. I'm, I am the daughter of my parents, Neil and Ellen Wilson, who uh, raised me in uh, what I now know to be the Anishinaabe territory of Southwestern Ontario. I, like so many of my generation, were oblivious um, to that at the time um, in the context in which we grew up and in the, um, I would say, glaring errors of omission in which we were taught and schooled. Um, and I've been back many times into the Anjanan community that is the nearest community to where I grew up and am very grateful for the circles of our lives that allow us to return to places where we miss some teachings along the way. Where I live now is in Yellowknife, Sombake, as it's called in Dene. It is the historic trading center of the Willaded Yellowknife's Dene, part of the Dene Nation. It's Treaty 8 territory, neighboring with Treaty 11. I uh, 
I am the wife of Stephen Caffrey and the mother of Kyla and Dale and Keenan. And here in our tradition, as I know in so many other places, we are defined by our relationships and we know our place in creation based on our relationships and our ties to others and our responsibilities to the places where we live. And that's been so eloquently described by many already. I live next door to, and this is significant to tell you, next door to the boundary of Treaty 11, which uh, starting in June of this year will be, uh, I won't say celebrating, acknowledging um, the 100th anniversary of the signing of Treaty 11, which is the last of the numbered treaties in Canada. Um, and the first um, of the signings there were uh, in a place called Fort Providence, uh, De Gagouti. It is um, the place where one of the oldest residential schools um, in Canada was established. And uh, it is significant to me in new ways today because I realized that even while they were signing that treaty 100 years ago, the residential school down the road had already been operational for over 35 years. And there were children from all up and down uh, the Mackenzie Valley, Desho, staying in that school um, uh, just down the path, just down the road, shall we say, but in the vicinity and yet um, out of mind, out of sight to those who were um, convening to do, take still more measures uh, to gain control over the territory. Well, I want to, uh, I want to acknowledge it with great thanks to uh, Peter Bisson, who's just spoken. Uh, you used a very beautiful phrase, Peter, and you, you said the gift of the TRC. And uh, I, um, I want to um, acknowledge my fellow commissioners, whom Harry has already named, Murray Sinclair and Wilton Littlechild. We were truly a threesome. Um, and uh, it was the synchronicity, I think, of uh, the gifts that each of us brought that allowed us to do the work that we did. But that gift of the TRC was not a gift that we brought as commissioners. It was a gift that was given to Canada by the courage of the 150,000 former students of residential schools and the 80,000 of those who were alive at the time of that historic court settlement that brought the churches and the governments um, to account for what had happened. Not in, a, not in a complete way, no one would ever suggest that, but in a way that had never happened before in our country and in a way that paved the way for the work of the TRC, which created all those opportunities over the course of six and a half years for Canada to begin to listen to voices that it had never heard before and for um, the survivors of the schools to be able to speak up and teach us all as the experts they were on their own childhood experiences. And so I hold up two documents today and one is the 94 calls to action of the TRC which I want to reference in a second and the other is this document which is the very one that we are talking about and officially launching today. Um, I want to reference within the 94 calls to action, three that are interrelated and that are particular to the role of the faith communities and to this work as one example of work that could and should be done. So I'm talking about calls to action 59, 60 and 61. And 59 really is a challenge to the churches, um, the church parties to the settlement agreement, that court case to basically teach themselves, to develop ongoing educational strategies to ensure that their respective congregations learn about their own church's role in colonization, the history and legacy of residential schools, and why apologies to former residential school students and their families and communities were necessary. I know we all are starv starving to go to the positive, but we have to register this bottom line fact. You don't have a truth and reconciliation commission in a context where everything is going well. You have it where something has gone terribly wrong and that there has been great harm and that it needs to be brought to the light. So that is one is about um, being truthful with oneself by way of faith communities. Number 60 talks about um, acknowledgement including acknowledgement of all that was denied and, and diminished, and including traditional indigenous spiritual practices and traditions. 
So we call upon leaders of the church and other faith communities in collaboration with indigenous spiritual leaders, survivors, schools of theology, seminaries, and other religious training centers to develop and teach curriculum for all student clergy and all clergy and staff who work in Aboriginal communities and, um, and communities on the need to respect Indigenous spirituality in its own right, the history and legacy of residential schools and the roles of the church parties in that system, the history and legacy of religious conflict in Aboriginal families and communities, and the responsibility that churches have to mitigate such conflicts and prevent spiritual, it makes me choke up, spiritual violence, spiritual violence, the abuses that we heard about from the more than 7,000 people who spoke to our commission included spiritual abuses. And then 61, which is really in a word about collaboration. And these three, education, acknowledgement, and collaboration really bring us uh, to today. We call upon church parties to the settlement agreement in collaboration with survivors and representatives of Aboriginal organizations to establish permanent funding and resources for Aboriginal people too, and in our call to action, we list a number of things and it's there for you to reference if you wanna look it up under call to action 61. But one of the things that specifically talks about in our list, which is not ever meant to be an exhaustive list, but a, um, a suggestive list, a starting point. One of the things we name is regional dialogues for indigenous spiritual leaders and youth to discuss indigenous spirituality self-determination and reconciliation. And, um, and another thing that's specifically named is um, education and relationship building projects. So um, it's, it's already been such a beautiful webinar and part of me would like to respond to what Lee has been talking about and uh, uh, what many of the other speakers have already named but what I want to zero in on is this is not being presented or offered today as a manifesto on, on uh, justice, but rather as a dialogue guide. It's picking up on what we learned from the experience of the TRC, which is that when we create space and give opportunity for people who have not typically sat together or gathered together to do that and to practice deep listening and to learn from each other, and especially to make space for voices that have not been heard before. A huge deepening of awareness can happen um, and a beginning of the understanding of the things that need to take place. There is so much work to do. Um, there's no short list of the things that need to be done, but it takes courage to try something and to move forward. I know it both during the commission, before the commission and in the years since the commission, many, many people have talked about um, the Kairos blanket exercise as a thing that, that they could do together that helped people begin to open tiny doors of understanding. Um, but what do you do after that? And many have talked about the need to be guided. And we, we've all learned we have to take people where they're at. We can be rightly impatient um, uh, that things are not further along. Uh, and we need to hold to the urgency of things. But at the same time, we have to take people where they're at and provide tools that are respectful and that can help people dig deeper and push harder and try harder. So I'm, I was glad to be called to the original visioning circle for this and to be supportive in the uh, peripheral ways that I have been able to be along the way. I'm, I'm really hopeful that this will be picked up as a resource, one more resource in our toolkit of big work that belongs to our whole country. As I've said from day one of being a commissioner, it is not an indigenous issue. It is Canada's big work and we need to be doing it together. Uh, so I just want to say, merci beaucoup, miigwech, and thank you so much for this work and the opportunity to share with you today. And um, many blessings on those on this call I see many friends, by the way, including some of our TRC honorary witnesses. Uh, thank you for joining. And I hope you can use this well going out into the wider world. Oh, oh can I ask uh, Marie for your, uh, <clears throat> I think you've given us uh, 
uh, something to be very thankful for uh, in, uh, in how you shared your life and managed the, the gift uh, that, uh, that came with the, with the commission. It'll be um, many generations will, that follow us will be forever thankful for, uh, for taking us to this place and, and, um, and doing it in a, in a good way. So thank you very much, Marie. And Marie brought up the, uh, introduced us to the concept of the uh, uh, blanket exercise and the blanket exercise predates the TRC. It's another one of those uh, projects that has produced great results. I know in Saskatchewan, uh, thousands of people have been touched by the blanket exercise and it never never fails to amaze me at the reaction that I, I uh, hear from, uh, from the participants, especially uh, from the settler community who feel cheated that, uh, that uh, their education completely ignored the indigenous uh, participation uh, in, in Canada. So I'd like to invite Ed Bianchi from, the, uh, from Kairos to uh, tell, uh, speak to us about the uh, uh, about the impact, I guess, and uh, about the process of uh, the blanket exercise. So welcome, Med. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Harry. Uh, really appreciate that uh, very gracious introduction. I, I also want to just extend thanks to uh, Catherine for her music and to uh, the other speakers, Bob, Sylvia, Lee, Peter, and Marie for their words so far. Um, uh, as I, as um, I just wanted to emphasize how much of an honor it is for Kairos to be part of this process from the beginning, part of that visionary group, and uh, and also part of this uh, launch party. So thank you, thank you to everyone involved. The uh, Harry was right when he said that the uh, Kairos blanket exercise predates the uh, TRC. In fact, it predates Kairos. <laughs> Uh, it, was, it was actually created in 1997 by one of the coalitions that became part of Kairos in 2001. And that was the Aboriginal Rights Coalition. Uh, and it was uh, created because uh, there was concern, especially amongst the Indigenous members of the Aboriginal Rights Coalition, that the recently released report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples which was uh, released in 1996, would uh, suffer the same fate as so many other royal commissions and end up on a shelf forgotten and gathering dust. And so uh, what uh, the Aboriginal Rights Coalition did at that time was put together a, a toolkit, a workbook that had uh, a number of different workshops and exercises uh, that were meant to help people understand what the Royal Commission was trying to teach us. And of course, for those of you who are familiar with those, that 4,000 page report, it has over 440 recommendations. Half of it is history, trying, uh, trying to help us all to understand this history that, as Harry mentioned, so many people even today will, are, are talking about not knowing at all. And so we came up with this uh, uh, exercise, a participatory interactive exercise that uses blankets to represent the land and where the participants engage and step into the role of uh, Indigenous people, First Nations, Inuit, and later Métis. And in about 45, 50 minutes, go through the history that the Royal Commission laid out from contact to today. And um, people have called this experience transformative um, in addition to you know, helping them learn parts of the history that they didn't know or weren't taught uh, because it's interactive and participatory because they're you know, in entering into the roles of, uh, of the people who were most impacted by the colonizers. Uh, it, it, has an, it, has a, it leaves an impression we call it a, a heart and mind exercise. Not only does it enrich the mind with all the information, but it has an impact on the heart too, because it makes people care about what le they're learning. It creates empathy. And as Marie said, it creates space, uh, a safe space and an opportunity for uh, indigenous peoples to share 
this history personally. It's an opportunity for participants to interact directly with Indigenous people. Um, the protocols are, are that, you know, Indigenous uh, people lead the exercise. Uh, all the facilitation teams are Indigenous led. And it's important to sort of understand that, uh, as Bob mentioned at the beginning, um, it's an exercise that is used in schools, but also beyond into, in the larger community. In fact, uh, we recently uh, shared a, a newsletter with uh, our facilitators across the country, elders and knowledge keepers, all the people who help us deliver the exercise on a regular basis. And, and it went out to over or close to a thousand people. So that's, that, that's how vast this network is of individuals who believe in what the exercise can do and you know the, the small part it can play in reconciliation. And, and so when Kairos was invited to participate in uh, this project, uh, you know we were honored and uh, didn't hesitate because as Marie said, oftentimes when people are introduced to the exercise and in many cases introduced to the history for the first time, their, their, their reaction, not surprisingly, is, you know, what, what can I do now? What can I do next? And uh, listening to Indigenous voices is, is just the perfect vehicle um, because so many of the issues that it delves into deeply, uh, so many of the topics that are, are covered in the in the guide are touched on in the Kairos Blanket exercise. So people will have sort of heard about the document discovery, heard about the Indian Act, heard about uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, heard about the treaties through the exercise and the guide presents the opportunity to sort of like, you know, dig into those issues a bit more deeply to listen to more of the voices who can share their knowledge and understanding and experience and just to sort of like continue to build on that experience in a positive uh, and uh, helpful way. So um, I'm, I'm very honored to be here today. As I said, it's very exciting uh, to be part of this. Uh, and I really look forward to, you know, seeing the, the, the guidebook uh, used and used again uh, across the country and, and become part of the Kairos Blanket Exercise experience. So thanks again. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, keep up the good work with the blanket exercise. I know it's making a, it's making a difference in, uh, in our communities here in Saskatchewan. Uh, teachers and uh, police uh, forces, uh, et cetera. Very, very, uh, very, uh, uh, good experience for uh, for a lot of people. The uh, <clears throat> of course uh, we we've gone through a number of speakers uh, giving us the uh, sort of where the content comes from for the uh, for the resource and now what do we do with the content and I'd like to uh, invite uh, Mark Hathaway from the uh, uh, the director of the Justice Forum uh, Jesuit Justice Forum to uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, the challenge of being uh, doing the editorial work. Uh, thanks so much, Harry, and thanks so much, Ed, as, as well. I mean, really, the, the Kairos blanket exercise is, is really considered part of the guide process. I mean, we're, we're asking everyone who, who engages, you know, with the guide to, you know, in the early sessions to actually do the Kairos blanket exercise if they haven't done it already. But, you, you know, as as great as the, the Kairos Blanket Exercise is, there's so much here that we know that this is a longer process. And even, of course, the guide just scratches the surface, but it's a way of starting to deepen some of those themes. Uh, in terms of the Jesuit Forum, as, as Peter had mentioned, it's not like, you know, the Jesuit Forum, when we started working on this guide, that we were, you know, experts on these themes. Far from it, you know, I, I, I think that this has been an incredible learning journey for us as well. And, uh, you know, the, the, what the Jesuit Forum did have was experience of creating kind of dialogue guides, which is, you know, good. But, you know, this is a, a very, I think, much more complex than anything that we'd ever dealt with before. And there's just so much that you could deal with. And then to try to get it into a 112 page guide, of course, is, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult process of, of 
curating and trying to find things and to really put together in a, an attractive way. And so we took it on, not because we thought that we were experts, but because we felt like we had a responsibility that this is uh, just something really, really important that uh, if we're going to move you know, this place we call Canada into a post-colonial future, we really need to, to kind of untie the, the, those knots of so many past mistakes and past injuries. And you know, that's a difficult process. Uh, it, I think the word reconciliation seems, you know, too weak to talk about. It's really a writing relationship process. Uh, and so to do that, uh, before I came, even became part of the forum, the person who was doing this was Anne-Marie Jackson, our former director. Uh, she brought together an advisory group uh, made up of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And that's really important. You've heard from, you know, Ed, Marie, uh, you know, several, several other people who, who, have, who have spoken today, uh, Harry, are all part of that advisory group. So they really help guide the process for us. Uh, and we wanted to create a guide that wasn't meant for exclusively for a church audience. We want something that would be really broad because this is a broad issue. I mean, really, you know, all sectors of society living in this land need to, need to take this. Uh, and as and as uh, Marie, both Marie Wilson and Ed were talking about, this this is not a, a guide. This is not a book just to sit down and read. I mean, certainly you can sit down and read it, but that's just the beginning. It really is about trying to uh, take those pieces and have deep listening and dialogue around them. Uh, it's really about a change of heart. It's about uh, it's really about trying to to and then to move to action, obviously, but to really, it, so yes, it's educational, but it's an education, both of mind and heart, I think. Uh, and when we, so when we wrote this, uh, we also wanted it to have curriculum pieces. So every session has, you know, suggestions that can be used in high school or post-secondary uh, context as well. And we also have a accompanying website and we're going to keep building those resources, uh, you know, to make those accessible to teachers so that they can just, you know, use those easily. We know that uh, in many places there aren't good curriculum resources, but of course, it, it, so it is for high school students, for university students, but also for adults, uh, uh, people who are outside of any formal education uh, setting. And in terms of writing it, uh, I, I mentioned the name Anne-Marie Jackson, our former director, was the one who really got this going and who was the supervising uh, editor. And she began work on this with Laurence Vieux, uh, who did some of the initial research. And then uh, for the past two years, uh, together with Anne-Marie, I've been working. Uh, and then uh, Victoria Blanco, who you'll see a bit later on, uh, had, was also part of that editorial team. I did a lot of the curation around the artwork, particularly finding that and getting permissions. To, and, and you'll see that this guide is really, it, it really is, is, I think in many ways, like a work of art. I mean, it's engaging because of the visuals, uh, which makes it, I think, a lot more accessible than just the book. And then the fourth member of our team, also very important was uh, JC Chiplo. Uh, the assistant editor came from uh, Garden Lake First Nation in, in Northwestern Ontario. Uh, so we had this team working together. We worked uh, probably the editorial process itself, uh, finding things, sorting through, doing that was, you know, roughly a year or so. And then, you know, the artwork, the layout, and, uh, you know, Simon uh, Apolloni will be talking about Novalis's role in doing that. And they did a beautiful job on the guide. Uh, but I, the result, I think, is a really user-friendly guide. It's 112 pages. It, it's spiral bound, so if you're using this, you know, in a group or something, you can you can you know bend it over. You can you can use it. It's meant to be used uh, and to engage people. And you know, it is really about, uh, as I say, not just reading, not just academic, but engaging in a process with others. Uh, ideally, in a in a small group circle, if it could be mixed with Indigenous, non-Indigenous, uh, newcomer, settler, uh, the better diversity in that circle, probably the better. Uh, but wherever you're able to do it, even if that isn't possible, any circle of people could do this. 
uh, and really to to approach it with an open heart an open mind and i think that that spirit of of learning and uh the flow of the guide begins with things uh looking at things like land the nature of treaties really indigenous worldviews to understand that first before going into the history of colonization and then moving and looking at what the process of decolonization and writing relationships might look like so it really is meant to be that kind of a process that we're moving through. Uh, so I'd like to encourage you know, everyone here today to, to get a hold of a copy, to share it, to gather a group of people together more than anything. The guide's available in both English and French. Uh, and if you're a teacher, that's also the, it's also a great resource. Uh, could say a lot more, but I know that we're running behind time. So I'll, I'll turn it back to Harry and let him uh, pass on to the next speaker. Well, thank you very much. You uh, <clears throat> put some uh, uh, good uh, marketing uh, comments there the, uh, to, to our listeners and to po population in general. But a, a good resource, a good resource requires a, a visual aesthetic that uh, that draws the eyes and and draws the uh, the potential reader to to itself. So I'd like to invite uh, Diane Motrell, who is uh, uh, an artist. Uh, she is. Uh, from the Eastern uh, Métis and uh, spends a lot of time with children, uh, uh, helping them to to discover their own artistic gifts. So, Diane. Thank you so much, Harry. First, I would like to say uh, that I'm honored and very humble. I would like to thank the Jesuit Forum and also Victoria Blanco that I have built relationship over the, the time and everything. This is an amazing uh, guide uh, for schools and others. The quality, the format, and all the many writers that wrote in this uh, dialogue is amazing. And I feel honored that they thought about me as wonderful other artists in there. Uh, because, you know, to become an apprentice doing uh, this kind of work, it, it demands to be an apprentice for a long, long time. Unfortunately, I didn't grow up traditionally. I grew up Catholic. And over my many years of being raised Catholic, I kind of lose myself. I didn't really understood the purpose of the real life, what I'm supposed to do. And because my dreams were very powerful, um, sometimes I never knew where to stand until I was invited by grandmothers uh, and elders that said to me that if I don't go back to the, tra the traditional way, I will probably have two, two years to live and would die because at that time I was already intoxicated with drinking and using drugs and many other things. But I always being a creative person and um, the many years that they gave me on healing myself, people don't believe that if you have accumulated over 20 years of addiction, it would take all, also more years to be able to uh, participate in your own healing. So the cover that you see here is uh, one of the painting that I did because I only paint since about four or five years. And that represents the grandmothers making sure that the people, they do understand uh, correctly the um, herbs. We know we have sacred herbs and established a relationship. And in the first cover that you could see, you have the uh, medicine wheel and she would explain to us which part of the medicine wheel the sacred herbs have. But all the dots that you see, we as people have a relationship with the land and all the herbs. And many times people say, oh, well, I don't have any issue in vegetarianism. I would say to them, yeah, but you still have to have a relationship, being respectful to the environment, to what you, if you eat different herbs or plants, you still have to establish and, and be respectful and offer gratitude to them because these are spirit also, like you are a spirit. So everything is 
in good shape, in good form. And uh, it is my way using my artwork to express back to our grandmothers, elders, to be grateful and express also gratitude for the gift of life. People think that life is just granted like this. Oh, no, it's not. It is a gift that has been given to you. You have a mandate down here on this earth, what we call Turtle Island. You have a mandate. So, and that's why going back to tradition, when we also do sometimes fasting, or some people call that vision quest, it align you to what you really need to do into your life. So my drawings, my paintings are an expression of gratitude to our grandmothers that are a huge pivot in our communities. And there are not so many grandmothers that could give back the teachings. So even at 66, I'm still learning again with them. I'm relearning the traditional language because I never grew up with the language. So I'm still learning. And you know, if you want to learn syllabic, it's, it's complicated but it is worth it because you know language is part of who you are as a person so i am very grateful again for the jesuit forum to put uh, my painting uh, aside of wonderful uh, recognized painters also there's a visual and there's words and there's teaching and i think every uh, people should get some for their student to really understand what our life is and uh, to be grateful to establish. I use my art to establish relationship and we will get to reconciliation if there's a true reconciliation. So let's get our voice, let's be allied. There's a long way to go, but let's have hope and be positive. And I'm going to give you the word back, Harry, and thank you so much to all the people that spoke before me also. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> it's always uh, interesting to, uh, to uh, listen to somebody who's involved in, uh, in the arts because they uh, have a, a unique perspective. So thank you very much, Diane. Uh, so we take all of this uh, material and then uh, it, it needs to become uh, become or take its final stage. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Simon Apolloni to uh, to fill us in on uh, what happens uh, at his end. Uh, Simon is uh, 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 associate publishing director with Novalis, and he's also uh, an instructor at the University of Toronto. So welcome, uh, Simon, and tell us about the book. Thank you, Harry. It, it was some three years ago when uh, Anne, Anne Marie Jackson gave me a call, the former director, as Mark mentioned, gave me a call to discuss this new project. I knew that we could really, really do a good job designing and printing this guide. And I was excited about it also because what it was about, I sensed it was going to be a, a fantastic resource. And so did the whole no Novalis team. Um, especially given the process that was planned uh, in, in creating it, in, in inclusive, affirming, and focused on the direction uh, from Indigenous peoples themselves. Now, Novalis is the largest bilingual religious publisher in, in, in Canada, uh, founded uh, way back in 1936 in Ottawa by the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, and we published uh, periodicals and books, uh, primarily in the religious field, uh, in English and French, uh, for many people. And most of you probably know us uh, for the weekly missalette, Living with Christ. This book, however, I think goes far beyond the usual religious publications that, that, that we, we do um, in order to help Christians explore their, their religious heritage and their faith. This book, as you all know, is for all Canadians uh, to help us tr truly reconcile with the Indigenous peoples, to tear down our colonial past. And as, as Harry uh, aptly said at the beginning of this webcast, to listen. We, he said we have to move to a culture of listening instead of a culture of control. Now, Novella is situated in the, on the uh, dish with one spoon territory. Uh, to, our, to our many nations, including the Mississaugas of, of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the 
the Wendat peoples, uh, uh, which is now also the home to many diverse First Nation peoples, like Lee Maracle, as she mentioned, uh, Inuit uh, and, and Métis. Um, I speak uh, for, for Novalis when I say, we are so proud to be part of this, this, this process. And it was a very, very complex project uh, for all our things we publish. When you bring in multiple people, uh, complex ideas, uh, beautiful art. Yes, thank you for the art. Um, it, 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 it requires far more much time. Um, but given the aim to promote right relationships, um, it, it, it was all worth it. So on behalf of the team uh, that worked on this project, especially a uh, shout out to Anne-Louise Matheny, the managing editor behind the project, who worked very closely with the, the Jesuit Forum team, uh, and Troy Cunningham, our, our production coordinator, who really brought that, what the core book into the printing stage. Thank you. And we're very happy and we're thankful to be part of this process. So thank you, Simon. Uh, uh, it, it really uh, tells us, you know, a, a little bit about the uh, publishing world in uh, in Canada. That uh, I, I never realized that Novalis was one of the biggest ones, and it was started by the Oblates. That's interesting. So thank you once again, and. Uh, and, and of course, we come to the uh, to one of the key objectives of any launch is, you know, how do I get to own my own copy and, and be able to uh, put it to uh, put it to good use in my own community. So I'll ask Victoria to uh, to uh, help us uh, with the right information for this. So Victoria. Thank you, Harry. Um, la première chose, c'est que c'est mardi le 4 mai qui aura lieu le lancement en français du guide de dialogue à l'écoute des voix autochtones préparé pour nous en collaboration avec Kairos Canada et les centres justice et foi. Vous devez vous inscrire à partir du lien uh, pour recevoir la ligne de Zoom. Merci. Um, I was just announcing that we'll be holding a, a second launch this on May 4th, so next week, uh, for the French uh, guide. Uh, with that said, and I realize that we are um, much over time, I'm just going to share my screen very quickly. Uh, I'm going to show you the website uh, that we have created so far, just so that you're all aware of what it looks like. Um, and you have different options, but the one I'm so you can look at the sessions um, and some of the online materials that you'll find uh, to guide you as you go through each session. Um, you can also order a guide. You click on order a guide and you fill out this Google form. Uh, we just ask you for your address and some information as to how you plan on using this guide. Um, and then you can click submit at the bottom um, and we will uh, reach out to you, send you an invoice, uh, and hopefully send you a guide right away. Thank you. So thank you, Victoria. And uh, I would encourage uh, encourage people to uh, to tell your neighbors about uh, uh, about this resource. Uh, tell your organizations about this resource. And, uh, and and make it work for for us as Canadians. Uh, I would like to invite Mark to uh, provide us with some uh, closing comments, and then we'll we'll be uh, uh, we'll ask Catherine to uh, to to perform one of her songs and carry us off into the uh, into the sky world. Mark? Well, I mean, there's so many people to thank that, I, and I know we're running late, but first off, I want to thank you, Harry, because you did a magnificent job uh, this evening. Uh, but for all the people who helped make this event possible, uh, Elder Bob Phillips, Sylvia McAdam, Lee Maracle, Catherine Martin, Diane Montreux, uh, Peter Bisson, Marie Wilson, Ed Bianchi, Simon Apollonia, and my colleague, Victoria, 
and, uh, and uh, Trevor working behind the scenes. I mean, thanks to all of you. And really, more than anything, this guide, uh, who I think we really need to thank are the wonderful writers and artists. Uh, there was an incredible amount of generosity on the part of so many indigenous authors and, write, and artists in terms of being willing to share uh, their insights and their knowledge and their creations in the guide. I mean, it, it, it's very humbling uh, to, to see that generosity. And I just want to say, you know, thank you, Miigwech. Uh, thank you to the advisory group as well, to the editorial team, to all the people. Very special thanks as well to Anne-Marie Jackson, our, our former director, who was so instrumental in getting this whole thing going and, and guiding the process through, through much of the way. Uh, so with that, I, I won't go anymore. I'm sure I've left out important people in the thanks. It's not for, for lack of uh, wanting to mention, just there's so many people to mention, but I, I'm very, very grateful. And uh, I'll turn things over to Catherine, who, for whom we're also very grateful uh, in terms of sharing her beautiful music with us. Thank you. Okay. There I am. Okay, so we're gonna sing a thank you song. In our language, it's me. Uh, it's Walaliok to all of you for being here, and Walalin for one. And just hang on. I look scary, but here I am. Sorry about this. I just uh, knocked us out. Mm -hmm. Back to meeting. All right. So I'm going to sing a thank you song that uh, Donna, Donna Augustine of Elsebuktuk, New Brunswick, of the Cove, taught to me. And everybody loves it. And I feel that it speaks to the simplicity of how Mi'kmaq and Wolostuk people um, do ceremony. And we basically... Thank, thank the sun for rising and for setting. And I think that's pretty much uh, the most beautiful thing we can do uh, to Mother Earth and thank her all the time for, for putting up with us. event a couple of years ago, the, um, the Order of Canada event. And I think, Lee, you are the order, you're a member of the order. You're not just a 
an Order of Canada recipient, now you're at the next level, whatever that one is. So hello and thanks for your words. I enjoyed it. And everybody else. Love you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks to all. And it's been wonderful having everyone here. Thanks again, Perry. Thank you. Thank you for, for the opportunity to participate this way. It's been, been very, very uplifting. Thank you. Yeah. It's so long. So. Oh.